Hi, I'm Tim Prossel, and I'm going to talk to you. Well, wait a second. This is Gretchen, Gretchen Green Eyes, and I'm going to talk to you about what I went through that convinced me um, that occult detective fiction didn't depend on Sherlock Holmes. That was the thinking for a while that. You have a bunch of little hit and misses um, developments in the history of the mystery of detective fiction, and then it all kind of comes together with Sherlock Holmes. He becomes very, very popular, and that opened up the gateway to occult detective fiction. Okay, we've got these these detectives um, who solve crimes. How can we come up with a variation on that? Let's bring in ghosts or vampires or werewolves. That was the thinking for quite a while. But I started to do some research and I found out that um, occult detective fiction has been around since the beginnings of traditional detective fiction. And I'm going to talk about how I came to that realization. I suppose people could disagree with me if they want to, but I have evidence. I have, I have good reasons for thinking what I'm thinking. First of all, I'm going to be throwing an awful lot of dates at you, so I have a little visual aid to help with that. Um, let's start at the beginning. Let's start with traditional criminal detective fiction. And here are two important dates related to that. There's 1841. This is when Edgar Allan Poe's detective character, C. Auguste Dupin, appeared before the public. It was his debut in The Murders of the Rue Morgue. There are two more Dupin stories. Probably the more famous one is The Purloined Letter. But the other important date is 1887, and that's when A, Scar a Study in Scarlet appeared before the public. Written by Arthur Conan Doyle, it introduced the public to a man named Sherlock Holmes. Two very important dates right there, and that'll give us a perspective on what's coming up. Now, jump to 2012, and that's when this issue of Clues, a journal of detection, was released. Um, it's a scholarly journal written by people who study detective fiction very closely. Kevin Bacon, the world's greatest hero. Guardians of the Galaxy reference there, folks. I do have an essay in this. That's why I have a copy of it. But that essay has nothing to do with what I'm talking about now. Instead, I will take a look at an essay written by a man named Pete Orford. And the title is, What Are They? The Pseudo-Mystery Stories of Fitzjames O'Brien. There's a little summary, a little abstract. Um, read that. Find out if you want to read the whole essay goes like this. The works of Fitzjames O'Brien are largely forgotten. The author considers how two of O'Brien's works resemble early detective fiction and assesses how the story's hero, Harry Escott, both conforms to and subverts the figure of the detective as presented by the book-ending icons of C. Auguste Dupin and Sherlock Holmes. Now, the interesting thing about Harry Escott is he comes in between those two major figures in the history of the mystery. So, back to the, back to the timeline. 1841, C. Auguste Dupin. 1887, Sherlock Holmes. 1855, that's when Harry Escott appeared. And what makes Harry Escott particularly interesting is he doesn't solve crimes. He solves supernatural mysteries. There are two Harry Escott stories. The first one is called The Pot of Tulips. Let me give you a quick uh, summary of that story. Harry Escott moves into a house. There's a ghost there. The ghost is trying to communicate with Harry, but he can't speak. He just, he, he can only do visual things. So somehow he presents a pot of tulips to Harry Escott. Harry is well rehearsed. He, he knows his stuff. He knows the supernatural. He knows how to explain why this ghost can't do anything other than present this image of a, of a pot of tulips. But Harry goes to work and he starts doing detective fiction. He and his buddy go out into the backyard, start digging up the garden um, because tulips, right? 
they don't find anything. So they go back inside, and after a while, Harry's sitting there in front of the fireplace, and he notices that there's this ceramic tile on the fireplace, like underneath the mantelpiece. And he says, oh, look, it's a pot of tulips. I better investigate this. So he looks closer, and he looks closer, and he starts playing around with things, and there's a latch. And he hits the latch. This pot of tulips tile opens up, and there's a hidden will. The ghost hid his will. It wasn't found by the people who dealt with his estate after he died. But now, because of 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 Harry Escott's, first of all, acceptance of the supernatural, he did believe that the ghost was a ghost and he was coming back for some reason. Because of Harry Escott's ability to unravel a pretty vague clue, a pot of tulips, um, the ghost gets what the ghost wants, which is for his, I believe it's his daughter, gets the inheritance. Um, and Harry Escott happens to marry the daughter too, so it works out well for everybody. Um, if you're interested, the second Harry Escott story is called What Was It? And it's a really bizarre little story. Um, Harry Escott moves into a different place this time. And from in the middle of the night, he wakes up because this weird thing has fallen on him. Um, it's, it's invisible, but it's physical. So he doesn't know what to do with it. He, he, eventually, he ties it up, and it's kind of a weird story. They, they end up starving whatever it is to death. And because they don't know what to do with it. That's why the title, what is it? Or what was it? Um, so the, the Harry Escott stories are these interesting mystery stories. Certainly, Harry Escott is a detective of sorts. Clients don't come to him for help. You know, stuff just falls into his lap with that second story literally falls into his lap um so that's not typical detective fiction but the whole thing isn't typical detective fiction these are supernatural stories so you've got that tradition that genre of fiction where ghosts and vampires are real and then you've got the mystery fiction of here's a clue here's a mystery try to figure it out harry s scott and he usually does um so, in my mind, that's, that's an occult detective. Now, let's take a look at how people were thinking about the history of the occult detective when I first started thinking about Harry Escott. A lot of people um, explain the history of occult detectives by saying it really all comes together in the late 1890s. Because there are two characters that appear then that really show, okay, this is a thing. This is occult detective. The first one, and a lot of people refer to this character as this is the start of occult detective fiction. It comes out in 1898. It's um, Flaxman Lowe is the name of the character. It, he was written by a uh, writing team, Ian H. Heron. And if you had a haunted house, Flaxman Lowe's the guy to go to because he'll figure it out. Sometimes his solutions to hauntings are a little bit questionable. He, he might say, well, you're going to have to tear down the house. <laughs> That's how he solves the problem. Um, some people go a year prior to Flaxman Lowe and say, no, really, the first occult detective is a guy named John Bell. He was written by another team of writers, uh, Mead and Eustace, I believe is how it's pronounced. John Bell debunks supernatural events. So if you have a haunted house, he would come to your house and say, no, it's not ghosts. Really what it is, is such and such. And some of his solutions are very far-fetched and wacky and, and kind of fun. But he's very much like Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes, you might know, had a few cases where it looked like something supernatural was happening. The Hound of the Baskervilles is probably the classic case. Um, people are saying, oh, there's a hellhound loose on the moors of Devon, and it's a result of the curse that was placed on Hugo Baskerville long ago, and now his ancestors not his ancestors, his descendants are now haunted by this hellhound. When it turns out Sherlock Holmes comes in and says, no, 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 it's no hellhound. Actually, here's what's going on. I won't explain it to you because um, that would ruin it. 
But uh, Sherlock Holmes has a couple of uh, other cases that are similar to that. Um, the Sussex Vampire, for instance. It looks like there's a vampire, but Sherlock Holmes, he'll set you right. Um, so I don't know. I, I don't know. I've, I've always felt that occult detective fiction needs to have the supernatural be a real thing. Uh, at least that's how I've always approached it, just debunking the supernatural. You know, I wouldn't consider Sherlock Holmes to be uh, uh, an occult detective because the supernatural is never really the supernatural. It's just uh, a mistake that people make. So when I talk about occult detective fiction, I'm talking about characters who are actually dealing with the supernatural. Now, these writers who were saying it's really John Bell and Flaxman Lowe, that's where, um, that's where occult detective fiction starts. And hey, look, it's about 10 years after Sherlock Holmes. They do occasionally mention earlier characters that served as prototypes for proper occult detect uh, detective characters. For instance, in Bram Stoker's novel Dracula, which came out in 1897. There's Dr. Van Helsing, who unravels the mystery. He knows his supernatural. Um, he knows vampires. He knows how to deal with them. He knows how to ultimately succeed against Dracula. So he's important. But the, some of these literary historians say, yeah, he's interesting, but he's not an occult detective. They will then go back to 1869 and Joseph Sheraton Le Fanu's character, Dr. Hesselius. And a lot of people say this is where occult detective fiction starts. Dr. Hesselius, um, it's in a story called Green Tea. And then Dr. Hesselius went on to become a frame narrator for other cases written by Le Fanu. Cases, they're really just supernatural stories. On occasion, the people who say you need Sherlock Holmes for you to have occult detective fiction will look back as far as 1859, Edward Bulwer-Linton's The Haunted and the Haunters. is a great story. Um, I, I guess it's a novella, really, but uh, the narrator of that story is, acts very much like an occult detective. He, he understands the supernatural. He studied it. He does a pretty good job of unraveling the mystery. But once he does that, he has a whole new problem. That's a story worth reading. But take a look at the dates. All of these stories, even the proto-occult detectives, all come after Harry Escott. So I had to ask myself, what's going on here? Has the history of occult detective fiction been misrepresented? Is there really a lot more to this than has been suggested? And I've searched and I searched and I found more and more works that fall in between Harry Escott and Sherlock Holmes or between Harry Escott and John Bell and Flaxman Lowe that, to my mind, did qualify for occult detective stories. Occasionally they were novels, occasionally they were single short stories. They weren't necessarily series, you know, multiple stories like Sherlock Holmes. Um, but there's a detective character, there's a, a mystery to be solved. The character uses the, the, the standard methods of a criminal detective, and I narrowed down what those were. Let me go over that for you. First of all, it's a character who analyzes physical evidence. Second, a character who gathers information from witnesses and or historical records. Three, surveils suspects. Does surveillance, a stakeout, for instance. Four, approaches the case with some objectivity, isn't personally involved in it. Five, um, applies logical reasoning. And six, plays a central role in solving the mystery. An occult detective doesn't need to exhibit all of these, but one, two, or three show up a lot, and four, five, and six are especially important. As I was finding these works that fit in between Harry Escott and Sherlock Holmes, that looked like occult detective fiction, but nobody was really talking about them. Um, I was posting all of this on my website, 
and somebody who has a ghost story related website of her own. Her name is Nina Zumel. She contacted me and said, Tim, I know you're working on this occult detective stuff. I ran across a spooky story from 1840. It's Henry William Herbert's The Haunted Homestead. And there's a character in it. It's the, the main character of the story named Dirk Erickson. And boy, he sure acts like a detective. What do you think? So I read this story. I was very skeptical because 1840, that's a year before Edgar Allan Poe's See Auguste Dupin stories came out. So I went to this thing with, uh, no, no, that's, that's not possible. But basically the story is this. Dirk Erickson is a frontiersman. He spends a lot of time out in the woods. He's a tracker. He knows how to read the forest. If he sees a broken twig, he can say something like, okay, that happened four days ago. It was broken by somebody who was riding a horse. The horse was lame in its left rear hoof. Um, <laughs> you know, he, he's got that ability. He's a lot like Natty Bumpo who you might have ne never heard of, but maybe you have. Um, James Fenimore Cooper's Natty Bumpo appears in five novels. The most famous is The Last of the Mohicans. The Last of the Mohicans is one of those novels that a lot of people have heard about it and very few people have read it. It's kind of like Moby Dick in that regard. Um, but Natty Bumpo is, is the same way. He knows how to read the, the woods, and that's how he survives. Dirk Erickson also reads the clues. And what happens is this clearly wealthy guy comes to this small, remote town. I think it's either in Vermont or New Hampshire. Comes into the tavern. Everybody goes, oh, that guy's got money. Um, and he says, I need some help. I'm trying to get somewhere where could, could somebody guide me? And this very unsavory character says, sure, sure. I can, I can get you there. Let's, let's go. I'll be your guide. <laughs> I don't know why he talks for me. He's from Minnesota, but, um, anyway, bad things happen back at the, the tavern. Um, there's this weird ghostly phenomena having happening. The whole building starts to shake, and I think there are these bright lights flashing all over the place, and everybody runs outside trying to figure out, you know, what's going on with this tavern. Dirk Erickson happens along and um, says, "Oh, every, everybody, calm down. I'll I'll go investigate." Well, it turns out that it is supernatural. But then he comes back out, and the horse of the wealthy guy comes back. By itself. Dirk Erickson turns into Sherlock Holmes. Now, this is how many years before Sherlock Holmes? 1840 versus 1887, 50 years um, before Sherlock Holmes. But he is just Sherlock Holmes. When this horse comes back, he spots this tiny bit of blood and says, oh, violence has been done. And look at this streak. This was done as the, the wealthy guy fell off of his horse, and there's this. This tells us this. Dirk Erickson leads the investigation. The weird supernatural events continue. Um, they don't communicate very well, but it keeps Dirk Erickson going. He says, I know something is up. There has been a murder. I, I, you know, I, I sense it. Otherwise, these weird things wouldn't be happening. And sure enough, he reads the physical evidence. There's surveillance involved. He, he persists. It takes quite a while. I think it takes him three years. But ultimately, he solves the mystery. Um, the, the final scene is they do have a, ch a chief suspect. It's the guy who guided the, the wealthy man. Um, so they keep their eye on him, but they just can't get the goods on him. They, they, you know, they can't even find the body of the wealthy man, but eventually they do. It's springtime and the snow is melting, but there's this one body-shaped patch of snow that isn't melted yet. And he says, dig there. And sure enough, they, they find the body and they, they solve the mystery that way. It kind of makes sense when you think about it naturally. I mean, if, if the body has been frozen not that far underground, that's a big ice cube. 
Um, and the snow is not going to melt as quickly there as, as other places. But that's how he, he solves the mystery. I, I gave it away. I completely ruined that story, didn't I? Read it anyway. It's interesting. But that's the interesting thing is it came out in 1840, a year before C. Auguste Dupin, Edgar Allan Poe, which so often people have said, 1840 is when detective fiction starts. I have stood in front of classrooms and said, 1841, 1841, that's when detective fiction starts. It was invented by Edgar Allan Poe. He woke up one day and said, I'm going to invent a new genre of fiction. It's going to be detective fiction. Nothing ever like this has happened before. Well, yeah, it has. And the more I've looked into it, the more I found other stories that are pre-Poe detective fiction. One that kind of stands out because Poe knew Henry William Herbert's work. He wrote about Henry William Herbert. Um, they lived both in the United States at the same time. Um, but 1837, another American writer that Poe knew William Evans Burton wrote a story called The Secret Self. It's not supernatural. It's not occult detective fiction, but it is definitely, in my mind at least, detective fiction. There's a character named L, L slash, um, as if to protect his real identity. That was something that people did back then. Um, it just gave fiction a, this little flavor of, of realism. But there are other, many, many other works that beat Poe. And if you go ahead and read them, you got to say, yeah, there was something happening before Poe invented detective fiction. Certainly, Poe gets, gets credit. Um, he did amazing things with detective fiction. He sort of refined it and he sent it in a particular direction. He sent it in the direction of Sherlock Holmes, the, the detective who's not a woodsman, but is just this sort of cerebral, you know, smart guy who enjoys solving puzzles. So he's attracted to crimes. That became one of the conventions. And you, I've never seen that prior to Poe. So maybe we can give him credit for that. But did Edgar Allan Poe invent detective fiction? I no longer think so. I did at one point, but uh, you know, looking into it, I now feel otherwise. Same story with occult detective fiction. Um, I was convinced what very intelligent people had said, detective fiction starts in the late 1890s Laxman Lowe is really the guy to keep your eye on. A few characters who are signs of things to come, but they're not quite there yet. I no longer believe that. I think that detective fiction and occult detective fiction started at the same time. They intertwined with each other. Um, and eventually, really, it's, it's the early 1900s where they really kind of split. They go in their own ways. There are are critics who say, don't put any ghosts in your detective fiction, who flat out state, state it. If you want to read more about this, um, a, a more orderly version of the lecture that I just gave, go to brombonesbooks.com, look for For Fun and Edification, look for the Chronological Bibliography of Early Occult Detectives, and go to the key for the chronological bibliography of early occult detectives, and you'll see a longer version, but probably a more comprehensible version of this with a lot of links. Um, you can see that there. If you want to find out, for instance, who are those literary scholars who were saying that you have to have Sherlock Holmes before you can have occult detectives, um, if you want their names, that's a good place to go. <sighs> Thanks for listening. <laughs> I think I'm done. Um, yeah, yeah, I think I've said everything I want to say. Thanks for, for listening. What happened to my cat? We may never know. We may never know. <laughs>